we have to go way back to when I was about, uh, I think, probably 16. And uh, I'd done playing professional football and I'd found a job, an odd job somewhere. And I had a transistor radio, as it says on the line notes, permanently glued to my ear. And uh, I just heard Sam Cooke coming over the airwaves singing Chain Gang. And I was, uh, you know, I was hooked ever since, you know, and Sam Cooke's always been my, my idol, along with all the others. But uh, I would say that would be around the mid-19, about 1968. Well, in those days, we were, we were starved of rhythm and blues, really, you know. Uh, um, and it was just the, the intimate sound of his voice, I suppose. Maybe it was just the track. It was just different to anything I'd heard. You know, this was the early 60s. Um, you know, the Stones were just breaking through, so, uh, you know, it was brand new for me. And it was all down to, you know, you, you wouldn't have this stuff played on the BBC. It was, as I said in the liner notes, it was Radio Luxembourg and, and Radio Caroline. No, really, because I didn't have the money. I wasn't earning enough money to go and buy LPs, as they were called in those days. I was struggling, but, uh, you know, they, they definitely, that style of singing had left uh, in a, a big impression on me. Because I, I was just trying to style my own vocal style. You know, I'd started off listening to, uh, you know, like the Carter family and Woody Guthrie, and then a little bit later I'd listen to, a bit earlier than that, I'd listen to Little Richard and the Girl Can't Help It. I'd seen my first rock and roll show when I was 11. My brother took me to see Bill Haley and the Comets. So, but this, this definitely sowed the seed. Sam Cooke, Otis, all those guys. Soul music, baby. Soul music, that's what it was. Uh, I suppose lyrically they weren't uh, earth-shattering, you know, uh, uh, but uh, I don't know, they, they were joyous, for want of a better word. Even the slow songs were joyous. Well, I've, I've lived with them for quite a while now, so, but they still, they're still very dear to me, and, uh, you know, that's why I've made this album, as, a, you know, a sign of respect, really. Well, it's been on, you know, it's been on my mind, as I said, in the liner notes once again, it's been on my mind for a long time, and I suppose I had to be pushed into doing it, you know, because I was a bit frightened of, of uh, tackling these songs because, you know, they were my heroes. Um, but we made a good start, you know, the first song we did was uh, Just My Imagination, that took off, then we did Rainy Night in Georgia, and I slowly gained in confidence, you know, and, and the one track that I was fearful of doing was... Uh, uh, Your Love Takes Me Higher, the Jackie Wilson song, because uh, my wife said, you've got to do that. And she pushed me to do that one. So I was very happy once I got the vocal down on that. Because these are brilliant singers, man. I mean, they're not, they're not messing about here. But, you know, the whole idea of this album, I'm not trying to challenge the originals. They're just alternate versions. They're my versions. There was a few arguments with the, you know, the record company and the management and everybody else connected with it, and that's good. That's all part of the creative process, you know. You want that, that input from everybody. Um, but uh, it's, with just my mate, well, well, the way I usually work is I, I'll do the vocal and I'll go away and I'll listen to it and I'll say, I know I can sing that better. Um, with those two songs, I think I got those on two or three takes. The tracks of my tears I did about three or four times, trying to make it trying to get it as far away from the original as I could. I think in the last three weeks of the, of, of the, of the sessions, we came up with six songs. Always works like that, finally. You go in the studio, you get six or seven tracks, you think, oh, that's great. And always, right at the death, when you nearly finish the album, another six tracks will come along and they'll be the ones that's used. We recorded 29 tracks, I think. Yeah, once again, everybody gets together and you take everything on board from the record company and everybody involved. And I've got a fabulous record company. They always give me great advice. No, they do. They're really good. It's a very, very close relationship I have with the record company. <laughs> everybody puts in their two cents worth, you know, and that's the way it should be done. There was a, there's a line you, you really can't cross, you know, and we got close to it a couple of times. There are songs like Sitting on the Dock of the Bay and uh, 
When a Man Loves a Woman and uh, Me and Missy Jones, which are really still on the radio a great deal. So you want to find ones that are not getting played that much. You know, My Sherry Amour was a bit of a risk, but I think we've gotten away with it. Otherwise, the others are big copyrights, but not really played a great deal on the radio. Well, you've obviously got the original on your mind, but uh, what we did, which is a pretty unique way, once the track was laid down, I got someone else to go in and sing it, like a, just a session singer. So I could concentrate on what they'd done. No, I wasn't going to copy what they'd done, but I didn't want to keep listening to the original. And it's quite remarkable, because when you are singing these songs, you suddenly, I don't know, I suppose it's soul music, but you come up with something that's totally different to the original. And you're, you're always inventing new ways of singing the songs, which I found when I did the American Songbook, so I applied that sort of thing to this, this soul album. Just changing little notes, but not losing the entire melody of the song. The love can take me higher. I was really, as I said, I was very anxious about doing that one because the Jackie Wilson track, let alone the vocal, is magnificent. And I don't think I could have done that without Steve Jordan and, uh, and, the, and the band he put together. They were all a challenge. They really were. Oh, it's, you know, it's going to be the... First of all, I think it's the, the drums and bass the rhythm section, the, the Funk Brothers, um, the unique way they've been recorded. You know, they weren't recorded in massive studios. I don't know if you've ever been to Nashville, have you, in Detroit? Uh, Hitsville, rather. Um, you know, and the, the Stax studios, they're all very small, all very unique, and just great musicians, great singers, great songs, well-recorded, great producers. They're just wonderful tracks, you know, brilliant, brilliant singers, beautifully created songs, beautifully, beautifully crafted songs. Authenticity. Thankfully, Steve Terrell and Steve Jordan had all these connections. I know Willie fairly well because I've worked down in Muscle Shoals way back in 1975. I did an album called Atlantic Crossing, and uh, so. But yeah, you'd need these guys. You'd need them to make it sound authentic. Yeah, something we found out. You know, you know. I don't. I'm never in the studio with the band, by the way. That's the way we record now. You know, I see the producers and I say, this is the key, this is the style I want, this is the tempo and this is the feel, and they go in and record it without me. Um, but with the same old song, that was my idea to do the first verse, uh, a slow verse, first verse, and then go into tempo. That, so that, I think, worked tremendously well. Smokey was on tour and he came in the studio, uh, you know, I think uh, I wasn't in town, I think I was up in Vancouver somewhere, and same with the girls, I didn't sing with them either. It's a shame, I mean, it's, I wish we could go back to doing that, but with schedules being as tight as they are and everybody being so busy. It actually works out easier because if you walk in, you've got to sing with someone you don't know, it's a bit, you know, a bit intimidating. This is a tremendous arrangement by Greg Filligate. He, uh, he arranged this and uh, we knew we had to take this one away, far away from the original, which it really is. It's, uh, it's almost like a, you know, 18, 12 overture, the way it builds. Smokey was uh, very impressed by it. You know, he's apparently when he was in the studio, he listened to it once, he said, well, what do you want me to do? But uh, he just gave it that wonderful little touch, that little falsetto he's got, you know, bless him. Great honour to have him on this album. Probably the most memorable thing about this song is not the recording of it, but the fact that Stevie offered to play on it. You know, bless him, he's, he's such a tender, wonderful man. He actually wrote me a song, uh, and he was actually demanding it be on this album. He said, this is just made for this album, it is a great song. But we said, you know, hopefully we'll be doing a follow-up album if it does well, so we'll put it on that. But uh, it wouldn't have been right to have done it for this album. Maybe the next album, you know, slip it in there. I will say I was very pleased. See, the, the two of them have got um, 
amazing ammunition when it comes to being to singing. I mean, they can hit every note and you know use many many notes, and I've heard the way they sing. But they they were really nice because they tamed it down and kept within the song and kept with me, you know, instead of screaming and shouting all off, you know, off the into the distance. <laughs> Well, Let It Be Me was always a duet. It was uh, Jerry Butler and... Uh, Betty Everett. Betty Everett. I was going to say Tammy, we met. <laughs> that wouldn't have been right. <laughs> be an interesting yeah. right. So that was always going to be a duet. But I, I actually like singing that one on my own, but of course I never will. Uh, and the other one is uh, You Make Me Feel Brand New. Mary J. Bride, she did a fabulous job on that as well. And I sent both the girls big bouquets of flowers, thanking them from the bottom of my heart. I think this was my idea to do this one. We were going to do, I think, uh, Clive Davis said, why don't we do I Can't Help Myself? But I said, I don't like the opening line, sugar pie, honey bunch. I've always despised that opening line. Sorry, Holland Dozier in Holland. So I said, what about, um, what about the same old song? So we agreed on that one. Uh, of course, I told you it was my idea to do the little bit, slow bit in the front. My gorgeous wife said, why don't you do this? And she wants me to do Very Superstitious as well, the Stevie Wonder thing. Which Stevie said, apparently, was written for Jeff Beck, believe it or not. And he never did it. Uh, so this is, my wife got me to do this one. She pushed and shoved until she got her own way, like she does. Because <laughs> it's such a great track on Jackie Wilson's. And as I said, you know, unless I get the track, I told uh, Steve Jordan, unless I get the, we get the track, I can't sing it. Because the track is ex extraordinary. No, Love Train, we actually had been playing live for the last three or four months. So the, uh, I said to the band, you know, lay, down, lay it down, this is what it sounds like. And I wanted it to sound like a garage band playing it, which is what they did. Uh, since then, it's, it's had a few overdubs. It's, it's, it's lost its... Uh, Garage, uh, garage band uh, appeal for me, but it's still very rhythmic, um, and it is what it is. I've always been very weary of doing Sam Cooke songs, you know, because he's so much, I'm, he's so in my blood, you know, it's, uh, I always find myself copying exactly what he did, so we, we took it the Memphis way. You know, we brought in the horns and we toughened it up. And I think it worked. You know, it's, it's I'm so unlike uh, his version. Greg arranged it. He took the middle eight and changed that t entirely. And we did it, uh, unlike the Temps version, we did almost did a country version because you got slide guitar on there and mandolins and things. Uh, and uh, wh why this one is so close to me is because it was the same year in 1971 that Maggie May was a hit. It's timeless that song, brilliant. Oh, we've, we're doing them across the road right now. I just went over and listened to the guys play. Uh, um, same old song and it's just spot on, you know, we've got it down. But, you know, once you've done a vocal and you've found your little groove and the way you want to do it, it's easy. It's finding that groove, you know, with the original in the back of your mind, you know, of Levi Stubbs, one of the great all-time R&B singers, and then trying to find out where you've got to take it, if anywhere, you know. There was a good version by Phil Collins, if you remember, of um, Can't Hurry Love which wasn't as good as the Supremes version, but it was good, you know, and you wanted to listen to it. And, and the same with Simply Red when he did um, If You Don't Know Me By Now, you know, it wasn't as good as Teddy Pendergrass. But it was good, and I think mine sort of comes right in the middle of the two somehow, so it be interesting to see what uh, Simply says about my version. <laughs> Crowd love the ballads. I like the up tempo stuff. I really do. You know, I know the audience hear me sing the ballads better, but I, I love the up tempo stuff. <laughs>